going, hello, uh, Harold Pilot. How you doing? My man, Harold, how are you? You look so great. good. Great to see you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, see, so this is what I'm concerned about. You look better than I do. I mean, uh, I don't know what we're going to do with that. My image seems to be jumping hey, around. Is that what you yeah, see? Yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's a reflection of your, um, you know, your moving, moving image on various issue positions that uh, <laughs> whenever you change your position, issue positions, the, the picture just jerks over. So, okay, I'm going to try nice to steady. Uh, I'm going to try to be steady. I don't know. That's a little disconcerting to me. Anyway, here we are. This is the Glenn Show at TV. My old friend, uh, colleague, I almost want to say, and uh, uh, Blogging Head's uh, sparring partner. Mm -hmm. Pollock of liberal persuasion of the uh, University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, uh, where he's a longtime professor, and I'm of Brown University. Um, and here we are. Uh, welcome to the Glenn Show, Harold. Great to be. Uh, yeah, we're talking about these different things, um, and uh, this is an era of controversy on race questions and on social policy questions, healthcare, uh, things like that. You're right in the thick of it. I'm a pundit, and sometimes we disagree. I, you know, um, one of the questions I thought we might explore in this conversation is, can we stay friends if we have different ideological reflexes or even different substantive positions on, on, on matters that we think are really important? You know, uh, uh, doesn't that put a real sort of strain on, on people's, uh, you know, sort of uh, the implicit compact of mutual respect on which friendship is built and people become disappointed in one another and so on. I don't want to soliloquize unduly, but uh, what do you think about all of that? Are we still friends, Harold, even though we disagree about, I don't know, what do we disagree about? Black Lives well, Matter or something? Yeah, we, we, we disagree about Black Lives Matter. We disagree on uh, points of emphasis on uh, various policy issues. Clearly, it is possible for liberals and conservatives to be friends because we, we are friends, so we have the existence proof uh, <laughs> of that. Uh, I, I think it's actually really important because I do think that we are all so vulnerable to circling the wagons and being within our own social groupings and to uh, and we and to become vulnerable to epistemic closure in such a profound way. And you know, one of the things I like about being active on the issue of intellectual disability is that it does not cut it, it does not create divisions in the usual way in, in the partisanship and uh, and ideological ways that we normally do on other issues. And uh, so you know, I will go out and sell Tootsie Rolls next to the guy from the Knights of Columbus, who is a pro life social conservative. And, uh, and that's great. You know, we're, we're there. We do our thing. We enjoy each other. There's some issues we don't talk about. Uh, and, uh, and that's fine. Uh, and I think it enriches everyone. And I think it also allows us to, if we don't do that, we really don't see the errors in our own ways of thinking. Uh, so, uh, um, so I, I think it's really important to have friends across these boundaries uh, you know, you know, as, as, as we try to do, what do you think? Oh, of course I agree with that. I was thinking about this guy. Um, I mentioned to you previously, Peter Moscos, uh, sociologist, criminologist at John Jay college, if I'm not mistaken, um, who spent a year, uh, he's a PhD from Harvard and he spent a year while he was writing his thesis as a cop. He actually went through the training and, uh, worked on online, uh, in inner city, Baltimore, wrote a book about a call cop in the hood. Uh, but I mean, he came out of his, you know, ivory tower academic milieu and he actually spent a year working as a cop. I mean, as a real cop. So he, so I asked him once, uh, what did he think the most important thing was that he learned from that experience to which his response was that he learned in a more intimate way than he could ever have imagined possible how a high school graduate or two year community college, working class white guy, uh, who's uh, relatively conservative of political opinion and, uh, you know, doesn't know anything about the etiquette of, uh, you know, racial progressivism or whatever, not like that, thinks, how they think, how they live, what world they came from, who they, who they are. And it's something that he could never have even imagined uh, sitting in a study, uh, you know, in Harvard Square or whatever. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, crossing the lines and stuff like that. So are we doing that, you and I, crossing lines? What lines are we crossing? I think I'm a conservative, Harold. That's the thing that's causing me to lose sleep at night. Uh, 
I think I'm discovering in my uh, sort of autobiographical reflection that I'm doing this year. That, uh, uh, <laughs> you what, know. what is it that makes you define yourself as a uh, as a conservative? And you know, what is it that you think? How do you conceive of yourself differently now than you would have before you did this kind of self reflection in the book project? Uh, I'm going back to the old Glenn, and I'm finding out that I agree with him more than I disagree with him. I actually think he was he was right about some some stuff. Okay, so. You know, Sandy Darity, the economist, we were at MIT together going all the way back 40 years. Yeah. And we recently did a blogging heads where we talked about his work on wealth differences by race and his baby bonds proposal and stuff like that. And he's a good guy and he's a professor at Duke. Yeah. Uh, he's a African American. Yeah. But uh, he and I have had this long running argument. I mean, 40 year argument about whether. It's worth the while, this is how I'm going to put it, to look at the supply side of the labor market when you talk about racial inequality in wages. What are the characteristics that blacks are bringing to the market, the value of them that might be different, that causes the blacks to get lower wages? Because Sandy, again, this is how I'm putting it, he's not here to speak for himself, would attribute it to a discrimination. He would, he would put it on the demand side of the labor market. And uh, related to that argument has been the argument that uh, that uh, there's such a thing as culture, values, things taught across generations and between uh, families at a point in time in a given social location because of the history and the ongoing practices and uh, how they live, uh, how they raise their kids, uh, what they regard to be honorable, uh, things of this kind. Such a thing as culture. And that culture might be, okay, if you use the word deficient here, it would be, you know, very argumentative to say it like that. So, but just not well adapted to, you know, the imperatives of uh, economic performance or something like that. So, and in trying to explain racial wage differences, so I'm, let me just make this short. I'm sorry, I know I'm going on. Nope. I'm trying to describe something on which I'm a conservative and or on which I want to say, even with 30 years or 40 years, of reflection, I'm still going to come out the same way, which other people maybe then would want to label conservative. Uh, well, I think that's, by the way, a big distinction how how uh, how you might be labeled within a particular set of conversations within the academic discourse, and and other ways we might think about whether you're conservative or not. If I went to a church on the south side of Chicago, I could probably find a very large number of middle-aged people who believe strongly that culture matters, who are fairly religious, who also support single-payer health care, and who have a bunch of views about public policy that would line up as liberal Democrats, but who also believe that uh, people should walk around with their pants pulled up and would say a bunch of things that uh, within a University of Chicago seminar would have them labeled as, uh, you know, as cultural conservatives. And I think that the words that we use uh, are somewhat impoverished or at least admit to multiple meanings that then allow them to be uh, to both cause confusion and allow them to be used as weapons. Uh, you know, it seems to me that you could be a believer in a whole set of public policies that are designed to transfer resources to disadvantaged people and also believe that the cultural practices among disadvantaged people are Im are important are important for a variety of reasons as potential obstacles to the advancement of those people and you could also believe that that culture is endogenous to the economic and social position that these individuals are in but that is nonetheless a challenge for these people if they're living in that cultural environment so i i think liberal and conservative is such a blunderbuss it gives us a zero one choice in describing a bunch of nuanced categories uh right okay sure that's right that makes a lot of sense uh, I wasn't saying anything, at least in my own mind, that was inconsistent with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're also involved in a whole series of conversations and academic disputes and discourses where, where you are – it's not so much that you are a conservative as much as you are not a person who is completely going with the flow of what is currently uh, the sort of modal person who would identify with racial liberalism. Yeah. Well, well, let me give you an idea of my conservatism. Okay. okay, so 
I actually think there's a lack of charity in the response of, of the militant black advocacy of our time, a lack of charity. I could even say a lack of Christian charity, although that would get me in trouble. I'm not talking about anybody's religion as such. Although the, the glib and easy atheism that we find, uh, for example, in Between the World and Me or something like that, I, not to change the subject to that specifically, but that would exemplify it. I mean, the kind of, you know, the idea that the, the civil rights marchers and their piety is uh, some kind of, you know, relative to Malcolm X's clear-eyed, rigid understanding of the limitations of America mm -hmm is something to almost be snickered at, you know, uh, look how dopely uh, hopeful they were, look how credulous they were, you know, this kind of uh, thing. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, there could be many examples of this. We were talking about one of them, which is if, uh, I mean, this is your subject, your subject about uh, police uh, treatment of, uh, of intellectually disabled people. Mm -hmm. But just that, you know, the whole issue of how police interact with the public could be uh, cast in a way that was much more universal and inclusive. Uh, it wasn't just uh, the reparations debate. I mean, these are different things to be sure, but mm -hmm. on the same spirit. I mean, so we have a past, I grant you, you know, we have, a, uh, you know, we could go on a great, great length about uh, the insidious uh, awfulness of this uh, legacy and uh, present day consequences thereof of racism, racial hierarchy, white supremacy, and so forth and so on. On the other hand, we're here we are, we're a republic. We're a nation of 350 damn near million people. And, uh, you know, the, the, the arrow points forward. We're in the 21st century. We're multiracial and whatnot. So you could ease back on the racial claim just out of a sense of civic duty. You know, you, you could say, yes, my ancestors were violated here. Let me see how I can leverage that into a more progressive and humane American social order. For everybody, for everybody, okay? That would be a gift. That would be an act of charity. That would be taking a posture, not because you have it coming by right, but because you, you, you have a more capacious understanding of the we than the narrow, limited, pigment-determined understanding deriving from your partial African heritage, this kind of thing. So that's that's another dimension of my conservatism that I want to put out on the table. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, and what's wrong with Christianity? What's wrong with the people who are in there praying like that? Are they dopes? OK, in other words, you haven't lived but a minute. You're 40 years old and you spend a little time in the library and you're going to decide that this, the many generations old tradition of meaning generation and maintenance of the soul that has developed among your own people. It's bunk. You well, know, well, the preachers well, I, are just a bunch of the preachers are just a bunch of hucksters. You know, I mean, so uh, I'm for the church that I'm just giving you yet another dimension of my of my uh, conservatism. Well, I, I actually think this is where one needs to bring. I think both activists and critiques of the activists have to bring a genuine analytic rigor to this. And one is that the African American church has served a number of functions. It's been, it has been, uh, I mean, a lot of what the civil rights movement was about was actually a struggle within that church to, f to try to encourage the use of that communal institution to be a force for civil rights. And, you know, and you can imagine in the, in the 1940s and 1950s, there were preachers who looked on this young Reverend King and, uh, were ambivalent about, uh, whether that was an appropriate way to mobilize collective resources. There's the theological aspects of what the preachers are saying. Uh, there's just the fact that it is the, it is the source of cultural capital and memory for in a, in a precious way for millions of people. I mean, this, this, and, and, uh, uh, I mean, there's, it was funny that I was watching, there was, there was a man who introduced, uh, Donald Trump at some hearing and he basically, he got in trouble because he said that, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders has to get with Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, Bernie Sanders is a better Christian than you are, buddy, you know. Oh, stop it. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, no, no, I, it, 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 oh, okay, Harold, I, I get it, I get it, I get it. Uh, Bernie Sanders is for a more, uh, uh, inclusive uh, ordering of uh, social relations through policy and law than is the Republican candidate that this guy supports. That much I'll buy. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I want to go on to say uh, one is a better Christian than the other. I think that doesn't take Christianity seriously. 
but, but I want to make another point here, which is that okay. the sexual identity revolution uh, may uh, it uh, flourish. My gay son, Glenn Lowry II, would have me say nothing else, and I don't want to say anything else. May it flourish. The sexual identity revolution, mm -hmm. let me say it another time, may it flourish, is driving a stake between the young people of Black Lives Matter and this cultural and spiritual heritage of the Black church to which uh, we were just referring. Because, of course, the demands not only from the people about police on the streets and whatnot, but also in the campuses and the whole energy that's uh, driving this uh, social media mediated uh, upswelling is about equality across a multi-vectored um, dimension vector of identity. And those things are interacting. Intersectionality is the word of the day. You know, they're interacting with each other. So mm -hmm. the gay women uh, who were instrumental in pushing Black Lives, hashtag Black Lives Matter, gayness is of independent Relevance. Now, we all know about the black church and its theological conservatism and so forth and so on. Some of the anti-theistic energies, I feel very confident that one hears on the radical edge of black activism today is driven by a contempt for the church's contempt for the claims to equality of the so-called sexual deviants. OK, heavy inverted commas of the so, you know, people who are not living like the Bible say they're supposed to be living. Yeah. Now, you know, I just think that needs to be put up front. I mean, I don't I don't necessarily have to take a side in that, although, as I've said, may the may people not be uh, pushed to the margins of society for who they happen to be. God love them and God let them flourish as who they are, whether they be gay, straight or whatever. Uh, but, um, you know, if you're going to have uh, I mean, you can't you can't just take one part of the church and, and, and just, you know, push. The, there has to be a reckoning somehow. And, I'm, and I do believe more charity. I mean, so, for example, calling these religious people bigots, you know, basically, you know, spitting in their faces and calling them bigots, uh, you know. Well, well, let me make a couple of comments to that. One is I think civility is and, 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 and a compassionate embracing of people from multiple perspectives is always important in political dialogue. And I do think that there's an absolutism and a self-righteousness uh, that is present in Black Lives Matter, is present in a lot of different movements, that is a problem and that it is also self-limiting. Uh, you know, everything we know about political persuasion, including, you know, these new randomized trials about canvassing and so on, you know, you have to be able to actually engage people where they live. And when I look at the lack of success in the Sanders campaign of, of reaching out to older African Americans, I think that a lot of the idealistic canvassers, precisely the people who are the most jazzed up to go and, you know, I'm going to go to your, I'm going to take seven hours out of my day on a Saturday. I'm going to go knock on your door. You know, I'm, 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 I'm motivated to that extent. A lot of those people, it is very, very hard for them to stay in a headspace of, you know, I really want to listen to what this person's life is about, what they have to say and why they are not with my person. And, and you can imagine a lot of arguments at people's front doors that specifically fail to demonstrate that kind of embracing, enjoying the difference in perspective. That you know, much as we talk about diversity, we actually don't enjoy being confronted in the flesh with people who genuinely disagree with us on things that we think are important. And you know, and and you, in order to be, I used to when I canvassed for Obama, I thought one of the really important things you have to be able to go to somebody's door, enjoy the fact, you know, say, isn't it interesting? That you're willing to talk to me. You're a Romney supporter, and, but but we got some. You know, there's a reason why you're willing to talk to me. And uh, and that's interesting, and that's I can learn something from you talking to you. If you can't take that perspective, you're not going to be effective in actually persuading people. Uh, now, I think on the church issues that you mentioned, uh, by the way, you're getting fuzzy on me. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear uh, you just uh, fine. The um, I'm worried uh, about my visual, but we'll just see how it comes out. 
Yeah, you look actually you look better visually. You in the fuzzy way you look better than you did when you were jumping around. So uh, you should. It's a good look for you. The okay. um, <laughs> but um, um, I I think there's a there's a, the church issue. I think was a much more pressing issue in 1994 than it is today. I think that what's you know the the black church was horrible. When I say the black church, I should say elements of the black church were horrible in the early days of HIV and. Uh, uh, and you know, really, there were, really was a problem that that there was a sort of middle class, socially conservative sensibility at precisely the worst moment when we needed to mobilize against this epidemic. And you know, the Congressional Black Caucus, which which was very much influenced by the political backing of that of those constituencies, you know, was a key obstacle to getting needle exchange done and some things that were critical. I think today. It's just totally different, you know. If you, that that, especially among the younger people who are involved in religious life, that that views on LGBT issues are just changing so quickly that it's a gen, it's a generational rather than a theological uh, division that's going on here. Even among you know, Repu- you know, if you look at the Republicans, the dog that doesn't bark, they don't talk about single-sex marriage anymore, really, at all. You, if, you, if you go through all the horrible things that Donald Trump says, he really doesn't touch LGBT much. Uh, okay, so um, I have a friend. Uh, she lives in Houston. Uh, she was just visiting here in San Francisco recently, and we spent a, a half a day together mm-hmm. uh, up in Napa, Napa Valley, you know, wine mm-hmm. country and stuff. Chalk in, just talking about this and that. Mm-hmm. And one of the issues that came up was how these churches, these black churches, and uh, she has spent uh, years in a Seventh-day Adventist congregation, mm-hmm. but uh, knows uh, the Baptists and whatnot as well of African-American, uh, deal with homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And she was drawing, she was making the point, which I thought was really this ironic point, that the music ministry in many churches will be animated by very talented African-American men who sing yeah. like gods and who play four instruments, yeah. uh, and they will be gay. Yes. And the pastor will be in the pulpit with the congregation bouncing around to the joyous sounds of this of music, preaching against homosexuality. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, now, everybody, you, you I, can say that's not a stable equilibrium, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think everybody recognizes that, and uh, I mean, there's just been such rapid social change, except on the abortion issue. I think the social conservatives have just lost the culture wars on these things, and and I think we all, because it's just too many people in our own lives, uh, you know, have uh, you know uh, okay. have so you know. But, 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 but I, I want to come back to the way to to uh, the to the police issue if we can. But we but I'll let you I'll let you. Oh, make. Well, let me just raise this. It was going to be on abortion. I don't know if it's a tangent. We can just bag it. Uh, mm-hmm. It was about my conservatism and my you know like elaborate confession about I'm conservative about this that and the other. I realize the old Glenn and the new Glenn are not that different. It was going to be on abortion. It was going to be the disaffect. Uh, okay, Roe v. Wade. I'm you know not for overturning that and you know. Uh, I would take the intellectual position that the states, you know, it would have been better if it had been left to the states, but whatever. Uh, left to the states, I think we would decide not to outlaw abortion, okay, but they would probably be regulated in some way. But I heard Hillary Clinton the other day say, you, you must have seen this, or you might have seen it, you know, when mm-hmm. questioned about uh, this because of the ridiculous thing that Donald Trump had said about mm-hmm. punishing women, the issue was being uh, raised. And she was talking basically about the, you know, life of the fetus and life of the mother. And she wanted to acknowledge that the fetus was a person, but that it was a person without constitutional rights. And I thought, and then whenever she would make reference, she would always put it in terms of the mother. And I just felt there was a kind of extremism or something that really was deeply disquieting to me in that, in that there's nothing wrong with acknowledging the, the humanity of the fetus. I mean, why not man up here and, and, and acknowledge that what you're doing is you're saying, the woman's command over her body uh, trumps the the right to quote unquote life, right quote unquote to life of of the fetus. Why don't we just man up and say that? So I, I don't know. They they just um, maybe well, that's maybe that's why this is the one culture war issue that the conservatives are still you know are still swinging away at. Well, I think there's a couple things. Uh, uh, I think one is abortion I do think is just a different issue. I think that if you're a liberal, you really, you really can't be against same-sex marriage. There's a bunch of things where 
where liberalism really does push you in a position that may or may not the society may not be may or may not be ready for it, but where liberalism kind of points to a pretty unique answer. You know, if somebody says you have two adults who are gay men who say we want to get married, we want to be, we want to be legally recognized, and we want to live our lives with equal respect to other people, you really can't say no to them and still be a liberal in my view. They're just very strong arguments from equal respect for people that push you in that direction. Uh, abortion is not the same kind of issue. You really there, – there, there is nothing intellectually rebuttable about saying I think the moral claims of the fetus ought to have more legal weight. And so people can people can disagree and the function in a liberal society is how do we operate given that we have these very deep disagreements and people on both sides have some very serious reasons that we have to respect that are leading them to what they believe. And and I personally don't uh, – I don't want to be shouting at people about abortion even though in the end I have an emphatic pro-choice position of what I want to see public policy to be. Uh, you know, I, I, and certainly in the disability community, you do not talk about abortion if you can avoid it with, uh, uh, you know, with people that are actively doing things to be constructive in that movement because people have reasons to be, you know, particularly powerful reasons to have, uh, uh, you know, strong views about abortion that you have to respect even if they don't happen to be yours. And I, um, uh, you know, my my in-laws, I think, were much were much uh, uh, closer to a pro-life perspective than I am, and, and my wife is an observant Catholic, and uh, she's pro-choice in her political views, uh, but it's uh, but she's also has a different perspective from what I have, and and uh, uh, now I think we have to think about abortion in a human way. You know, Indiana just passed a law that said you cannot. Have an abortion for the reason uh, if you're if you're if you have an amniocentesis and your developing fetus has a genetic abnormality that cannot be the stated reason for an abortion. And uh, so then you state another reason. I mean, uh, your reason is easy to disguise. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. In pre first of all, there's that. But secondly, one of the things that that does, and of course, there's a question of how, what kinds of records doctors keep because you know, as a person who's giving you the test result and so on. Uh, what, what one of the consequences of this is that people who are anxious about certain kinds of disabilities may feel that, that they can't really openly discuss that you know, with their doctor to understand, you know, what, what is, you know, yeah, they might need information. I, yeah. Yeah. And about contingencies, which if they explore reveals to the doctor that the reason for electing abortion would be contrary to what, uh, this, uh, this uh, statute would require. And, and one of the interesting things, by the way, again, is, uh, and I'm just picking this byway on the abortion issue because you mentioned it. Yeah. There's never been, if you look at, um, uh, the way people live in America, there's never been a better time to be a person living with a with an intellectual disability than in 2016. It is just amazing how much progress has been made on that issue in just so many ways. There are also more and more medical technologies that allow people to do genetic testing and so on. And there is some sense where in people's lives uh, – the fact that we accept that people are using these technologies and often choose to terminate a pregnancy does not seem to lead us to be more callous towards people with these disabilities at all. You know, there is some, there is some sense in which the metaphysics seems to be kind of in the pro-choice way that people are actually thinking about this in a, in a, in their day-to-day -day lives that, uh, we, we have, uh, that we really don't think about we really separate out these questions. There's this person who's pregnant who has a moral decision that they make, a life decision that they make. If they choose to terminate that pregnancy, almost everybody's okay with that, uh, if it, especially for this reason. If they don't and they, and they have that child, then we say, okay, we are, now we will help you and help that child you know, thrive in a way that we haven't before. And uh, I just think it's interesting that there was a great fear among many advocates for the disabled that we would it would lead us to be more callous towards people with you know with genetic abnormalities. You really think you know? I mean, I would have thought too early to tell by a long shot. Too early to tell. That feels to me more like a fifty-year or a hundred-year retrospective assessment than one that you could make in a decade. 
Hey, I teach at the University of Chicago. We can anticipate those 50 and 100 year uh, things. Well, the other thing I was going to say is, I mean, you made a very strong assertion about liberalism. And, you know, we both are not uh, practitioners of the art of political philosophy and political theory, although we are appreciators of that art. Both of us are. Yeah. Wide, widely read in the, you know, the Rawlsian and Walzerian and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, Nagel, Nagelian, if that's a word. Uh, so, but I want to say, man, I, I just, you know, there's a communitarian streak in me that uh, wonders whether or not the resources of uh, liberalism are quite as robust as you say. You say they give very clear, straight arrow answers on questions about sexual uh, 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 orientation and e equality. And I, I think, you know, I'm not going to quibble with that. I think that's basically right. But I think on some of these other things, um, you know, so uh, the reason I question your claim, your claim was that the uh, election, the ability to be elective about whether or not to carry to a term a pregnancy of a child that might be intellectually disabled and people opting out would somehow contaminate the sphere of value so that the lives of people who were born who were intellectually disabled would be taken of as of less value. Well, I'm saying that that, that, that has not happened. Society. I understand that you're saying yeah. that that has not happened and you're, you're celebrating that. Yeah. And I want to say the foundation for how it is that a society comes to value life in its many different potential and realized forms. What holds that up? What allows that, for example, the death penalty? Okay. How do we think about the death penalty? How do we want to think about the death penalty? Um, uh, late term abortion. Okay. I mean, where you might put that boundary in terms of viability of the fetus outside the womb or something like that. Um, uh, healthcare, uh, including end of life care, uh, euthanasia and, uh, resource allocation decisions that have the implication of, you know, anticipate, you know, whatever, and how you value. What holds all of that together? What makes it buoyant? What, what gives it an affirmative, life affirming cast? And to the idea that irrational spiritual commitments that are somehow brainstem activated rather than prefrontal cortex activated, that are manifest in our traditions, in our, in our um, beliefs, uh, mediated by culture, uh, uh, mysterious, uh, uh, calling on all kinds of ritualistic, you know, uh, Durkheimian kind of human uh, consciousness uh, is not instrumental in holding up this buoyancy, that it's all liberalism, all the calculation from some principles from John Stuart Mill to John Rawls. I'm not so sure about that. Some of it might be from the gut and from the heart. You know what I'm well, saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, there's two. I think there's multiple strains going on. There is, there is what kinds of justifications are ultimately compelling, and then there's what's holding us together as a society and as people. What are the deep? What are the elemental uh, things that we value in each other and in ourselves? And, and where do those come from? And how does how does our how do our, how does our communal life reinforce those things? Uh, I think that you know if I if I if I'm a Supreme Court justice, I think I want them pretty much sticking to Rawls and Mills and the Constitution and and so on. But we know that we certainly know the importance of of uh, of community and the fact that embedded within these within our, in our religious life is something that holds so much in it, not just the theological content of you know particular biblical text, but also hundreds of years of conversation and of interaction among people that 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 has a depth to it that uh you know that we certainly we want to we want to be critical of it but uh, uh but we also want to understand that there's a tremendous amount of value in our common life that is expressed through that in that place and in the language of those uh you know of those religious uh ideas uh, there, um, I, I think I want to, um, uh, I want to, I want to move though in the conversation if that's okay. okay. Yeah, no, time is limited, and there are things you want to say, so speak on. Uh, although I didn't agree with everything that was just said <laughs> oh, well, what, what, about the Supreme Court and uh, how you'd want to keep it sanitized from the religious sphere. I think formally, so yes, I would not accept opinions and arguments that made reference to Scripture as their uh, source of authority, but implicitly and motivationally. 
you know, we can't we can count the Catholics and we can count the Jews on the Supreme Court. I mean, I mean anybody can count them. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, the idea that uh, Jewish liberalism and its kind of ethos has no influence on the law of the United States is ridiculous. Of course it does, as expressed through undoubtedly the intellectual and emotional and psychological being of the people who are from that tradition and who inhabit the court. Likewise, Catholicism. I mean, you know, so I, I, I'm not sure we can ever excise those uh, influences from, um, you know, areas of discretion that can be. Well, yeah, anyway. Let me say, by the way, I, I think the greatest contribution of Jewish liberalism is just to be a group of people who were in many ways outside of and victims of the dominant traditions of Western culture. And, you know, tradition, you, I, I think that uh, that that quasi outsiderness and critical distance, it makes it it's a very powerful way to recognize some of the awful things in the traditions that might have otherwise gone unquestioned. I mean, there is something about growing up, you know, not, not my generation, but my parents generation where they understood that uh, if you walked past the Catholic Church on Easter, you might get the crap beaten out of you when people got out of church. You know that uh, I mean not as powerful a a subordination as African Americans experience in any number of oh no why of would you say ways. that why but, why would you say that well I think in the in the in the memory of people that I know it was still it was certainly a different degree of marginalization and less intense but uh, well I don't want to take you off your point go ahead but but, but but I mean I I think that. One of the functions of the court is to protect people against the dominant traditions in the society and the and the horrible things that are contained within our religious life that are illiberal that need to be that need to be controlled and 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 uh, so uh, so it, now it may be you know the, so so there's that but well, let me, let, let me move to uh, <laughs> you would like to see the a greater degree of charity and inclusiveness and universality to uh, some of the protests like Black Lives Matter and, and related protests that people have. Uh, yeah, you know, let, me, now, let me just say this very briefly to say what it is that I would want. Yeah. Not just Black Lives Matter, not just Black Lives Matter. There's a lot of activism on the campus, even at the editorial pages of the New York Times, even uh, amongst people who write national book award winning books. Mm -hmm. uh, the culture's defining of the issue in terms of race, obligation, equity, justice, inclusion, fairness, racism, structural racism, and so forth and so forth. I want it to be more universalistic and less uh, race claim making. And I, I say a spirit of Christian charity. Uh, and uh, I somewhat wink when I say Christian, mm -hmm. but uh, not just taking, not just quid pro quoing. Not just uh, a reckoning uh, of accounts, but a contribution to the civic we that is uh, broader than simply an African American claim. That's that's what I w that's what I was saying. And then I thought of one example of that as being this thing about intellectual disability. Well, you know, let me pick up on the um, on the on the protests against police, and let's see if there's. I think there's a Venn diagram that that there in order to mobilize people effectively, you have this reality that you have low income. African American and Latino communities that have this very powerful experience of of uh, interactions with police that especially young people find you know unacceptable and that it's just a, we have just seen as a very powerful way that people are mobilized to deal with it and there's certainly a racial there's a there's an element of racial solidarity and class, racial intersection with class and so on solidarity going on there many of the actual things that the protesters are asking for, I think, can be can be justified and argued for in a universalistic way. And what are those the, things, Harold? Can you just say quickly? Well, so I think so. So, uh, so the one example that that we talked about a little bit before, de-escalation. So many. One of the concerns of then there's a hashtag disabled lives matter, which sometimes goes with the Black Lives Matter. So many, many people in communities in Chicago, in Detroit, New York are very upset that their interactions uh, with people who are in mental health crisis or behavioral crisis and who end up being harmed or killed by police. And that, that and they want to see police behave differently. And I'll, I'll, there's an anecdote I want to tell you about intellectual disability that, that is worth, I think is worth the time. So there's a young man named Robert Saylor, 26 years old. He had Down syndrome and he lived in Maryland. And he had a full-time attendant, uh, Mary Crosby would take him 
uh, you know, taking places and so on. So she took him to the movies. He saw Zero Dark Thirty at the movies when, about uh, about uh, three years ago. This happened. So he gets done at the movie and he comes out and he goes into the hotel lobby and uh, and he's agitated. And so his attendant calls his mom and she says, you know, he's agitated. What do I do? He's uh, uh, and uh, um, and his mom says, why don't you go get the car, give him a chance to kind of calm down, and then maybe when you come back, he'll be ready to do whatever the next thing is to do. So woman goes and gets the car. And while she's gone, he slips back in the movie theater and he sits back in his original seat because he wants to watch the movie again. And he had been agitated because he wanted to watch the movie again. And the hotel manager goes and he calls security when he sees uh, – you know, when he sees Sailor go back into the theater and these three off-duty deputies who are the mall security show up and and the attendant, and I think it's relevant, by the way, that she's an 18-year-old young woman. Uh, she says she says he doesn't like to be touched. Why don't you just wait I mean, he's, uh, and, you know, we'll figure out some way to deal with this. Uh, the deputies won't have that. They're sitting there. He's in his seat and he's getting progressively more – they're trying to get him to – to, to leave and he's getting more more aggravated and and he's cursing at them eventually and they decide they're going to try to drag him out and he's five feet six and 300 pounds and he has uh, you know he lives with down syndrome and he ends up on the ground prone in cuffs with these three deputies on him and he dies from suffocation or something he fractured a bone in his, oh, in his throat oh god no and this, and there are other cases like this. If you sort of go and look for these, there's other ones. And now you didn't mention race, and I assume it's not relevant to this. Case. He's a middle. His family's middle class white people, um, and uh, you know, in fact, his mom was en route to the theater at the time. You know, as soon as his mom got the phone call, she's like, "I'm going to come down." And 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 all this time is happening. The attendant is saying, "Like, don't touch him. You know, don't." Um, and he's sitting. He's just sitting in his They're chair. Sitting. They could have just left him there. I mean, someone could have just bought him a movie ticket for twelve bucks. Yeah, and and um, and what? And this case. And by the way, the, in a legal proceeding, the deputies basically say we followed our training to do steady escalation. You know, he's, our job was to was to establish his compliance with with our instruction, even though. It, and they, and they were. By the way, I think they were they were horrified that he died. I mean, they, there was no intention to kill him in this. Sure. They just. They were just trying to get a disobedient guy to do what they wanted, and you know, and, and obviously, if you you know, the Eric Garner case. Is well, I was thinking the Eric different. Garner case, but I didn't want to say anything because you know it would seem to be siding with the cops if you even mentioned it in this in this context. And 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 I think what a lot of the people want who are protesting against the police is they say we want you to deal with people, we want you to to learn how to deal with quiet authority and with less. Uh, jumping to control every situation, even when that can have, in this case, tragic consequences. And if I am a big city mayor, or for that matter, from a police chief, I look at some of the things that these protesters are asking for, and I'm saying, you know what? This is exactly what That's we need to learn thing. how to do. And and now one of the things that they're up against is the rank and file officers and the way they're socialized and trained that makes this very hard, particularly when you think some guy – they make a big distinction. If you're talking to Jesus, it's actually very easy for the officers to step back and behave to you in a more compassionate way when they sort of recognize that – that I should say when you're talking to Jesus and he appears to be talking to you back in real time, uh, you know, they're, they're – uh, uh, when they see someone that they code as being an asshole, there's actually a famous paper that refers to assholes, uh, you know, and if you're in that box, you know, then they're like, well, you have to, uh, I have to establish control and I can't allow you to do that. So that's one example. No, this is, sport, can, and, I'm sorry, yeah, I just want to make an observation as a game theorist, you know, this is such an interestingly rich strategic tableau that you're describing where each party has beliefs about the intentions and orientations of the other where they have uh, to make decisions in short order and uh, are responsive to cues of one kind or another. It's just, uh, and, and the, the notion that it would be possible to improve upon whatever is the pattern that has been established by history and tradition is a very overwhelmingly intellectually compelling case to me. I'm almost certain we can do better than what we're doing. Um, <laughs> But and, it, and it would, by the it would way, imply a less adversarial relationship, would it not, between community and police, I mean, in order to, to bring this about? 
Absolutely. And by the way, I should say that I have been in my conversations with law enforcement people over years. I've often raised this issue because, you know, you know I tell you, Vincent was once sick and, we, and the local police were called with the ambulance. He had to go to the – he wanted to go to the hospital. And this officer – Vincent wanted to slide on the floor and Vincent didn't want to get on the floor. And the officer sort of put his hands up to push on Vincent's shoulders and, and, and Vincent didn't like that. He started to push back. And all of a sudden there was this realization, wow, he's a strong 250 pound man. And like this benign situation all of a sudden becomes something different. And whenever I presented that before Black Lives Matter, what I would get from law enforcement people that I knew they would be like, Dr. Pollock, you are like the nicest person. I, it's so wonderful. You know, you're taking care of your brother-in-law. So this is like, you are such a wonderful person. We got it covered. You know, this is, we're, you know, we're, we, we know our job. And, th- and in the, you know, in this pat on the head uh, uh, kind of response. And, uh, you know, there is something different because the power dynamic has shifted. And, and another, another way that it has shifted is I think I've been in a million conversations in a law enforcement context where people say things like, we don't want our city X, whatever X is. We don't want to be another Detroit. If, if violence gets bad, middle, upper middle class people will leave the city and we will lose our tax base and we will die. Yeah. And which, by the way, I totally – I think is a very reasonable pragmatic fear. Yeah. Uh, that, um, and – there was always the conversation we have to be we have to work in these low income communities of color pragmatically we have to find ways to work in these communities because otherwise we have no way of actually doing our job and finding the criminals and all this other kind of stuff but there was never the sense that we are accountable to these communities and that if they just don't like what we're doing that they can exact a penalty from us the real people that we're worried about are the are the mobile factors who might leave the city and so you're you're really worried about Lincoln Park you're really worried about you know, every every city has its equivalent, uh, and and uh, and I think one of the valuable things about some of the recent protests is all of a sudden there really is a genuine accountability. You know what? If you if if a young man dies because uh, law enforcement officers behave inappropriately, there really will be uh, a consequence. Uh, you know, f- you know that matters for. Uh, for local politicians, for the police department itself, we can't. Uh, it, uh, we really have to take this more seriously than we have in the past. We have to look at our collective bargaining agreements that that uh, that often facilitate officer misconduct, and we have to revisit those. and uh, And I think there's a lot that's going on because of the protest that is actually good public policy. Uh, okay, this and, is very you know, good, Harold. I, I uh, uh, extremely informative. Uh, a very complicated uh, uh, landscape that you're painting. Uh, the police unions, you know, <laughs> yeah, and governance. I mean, I, you know, okay, so you're going to need to maintain order. That's why you've got police forces and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the accountability, the structure of governance, and in the in the a multi-class race matrix of identity and influence, money and whatnot in a complex urban environment, who's really the state really responsive to whose interests is it really responsive to? Yeah. So uh, yeah, definitely an imbalance. Uh, the communities, if we're going to have to parse this thing about punishing and restricting disorderly persons on the one hand, and also uh, you know limiting the uh, abusive power of the state and trying to cultivate the right attitude of service for agents of the state toward their uh, toward their clients. Uh, if, we, if we're going to do that, we have to, uh, you know, have to reckon with the political landscape as it is. Okay, so, you know, demonstration, protest, and agitation, and, con- you know, I, I, I'm getting it. I guess what I'm mm-hmm. saying is I'm, I'm, I'm really just repeating what you said. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing uh, value in that in a way that I don't know that I had really, uh, really previously appreciated. And I think getting back to this relationship with the police – I, I think that the police have to earn – I think the community and the police have to find a way to work together where there's a sense of legitimacy in what the police are doing and and where the police are backed up by the community. I think – I do think that I'd like to see a more positive and specific public safety agenda coming out of uh, – uh, coming out of some of the protest movements. I think Campaign Zero has some ideas on the table that are valuable. And I'd like to see more of that because I do worry that – I mean right now crime is low. I mean there's been particular places where it's gone up. But we're still 
we're still in a 2016 world rather than a 1992 world. If we start to go back to that 1992 world, progressives have to have a positive public safety agenda that says, okay, this is what we're, this is how we're going to actually keep people safe. Otherwise, I do worry that both within the black community and within the white community and other communities that there will be a real backlash to this. And well, crime is low overall. I mean, this long term trend that started in the early 90s yeah. and we're still enjoying the benefit of that. On the other hand, it has spiked and broken out with at least uh, a public uh, glare in certain places like the city yeah. you live in, Chicago. And so there are stories in your newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, about people moving off the south side of Chicago because they're afraid of violence. And I know a little bit about that personally because my son Alden and his wife Adrian and their children live, you know, in a neighborhood that's uh, just a little bit south of uh, Inglewood that is, uh, you know, troubled and has a lot of bad shit happening. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, <sighs> The, you say there should be a positive public safety agenda attendant to the demands for better treatment uh, uh, of the police, delivering better treatment to African-American and other residents of the city. Uh, absolutely. What I want to ask you, though, is what about black crime? OK, now I'm going to just be very provocative and putting it like that. Black crime. Okay. I know you're not supposed to talk like that. And I have a purpose. I mean... If black lives matter, can we really keep the blackness of crime out of the conversation? The blackness of crime? What do I mean by that? Well, I just simply mean the disproportionate overrepresentation of African Americans amongst criminal offenders, so measured in any kind of way that you would want to measure it. Now, I know again, I'll say it again, you know, there's all kind of dog whistle stuff going on and you're just not supposed to talk about it. But, um, Given that we're talking about race, given that race has been made the issue of the day, can you really credibly, effectively excise from people's minds this association? And uh, no, no, of course you cannot do so. Uh, so uh, one argument, one set of arguments is so-called black on black crime should be on the agenda of the Black Lives Matter movement, to which there are all these responses. You know this better than anybody. Uh, well, of course, it is on the agenda of the black lives because many of the people who are at the forefront of the Black Lives Matter are also at the forefront of protesting against uh, violence against African-Americans and so forth and so on. Um, there is, from the police union point of view, the idea who does that actually has to respond to these calls yeah. when they talk about somebody who's armed and dangerous? Who do you think has to actually do that? You know that? That's me. And you guys uh, mucking around with you want to charge me if I do something wrong. I'm actually on the front lines here and I'm, I'm sweeping up the mess and, I, and my life is in danger. Um, and is there a racial element to that? I'm not supposed to notice. I'm not supposed to notice that these communities really are different. In terms of the, the risk that they pose to me, I'm supposed to somehow be always on guard to not offend your racial sensibility. Oh, and by the way, when I'm having a beer with my buddy and somebody has snuck a tape recorder in there and we're just talking like a couple of working class white guys would talk. You don't think black guys who would get together and drink beer talk don't talk racist talk? Of course they talk racist talk. We're just a couple of guys who went to high school together and we just left a murder scene. And so I used the N word. Now you're going to make a federal case out of that and I'm risking my life. Like well, that. let me say a couple of things. One is, the, the, we do have, uh, fortunately, the police departments in many big cities uh, are no longer as uh, lily white as they used to be, and okay. so those working class cops, uh, you know, one hopes that they have they have some uh, African Americans, they have some Latinos, they may even have some LGBT folks uh, <laughs> uh, as well, and and I think it's important that uh, you know that they do and. I mean, certainly one of the problems in Chicago is that, uh, you know, when you, if, when we, to the extent that we still have a police force that's so concentrated, sort of in in, in the legacy force that we had, uh, where you have people who don't live near uh, the African American communities who who reinforce some of the negative the things that we see. I think it's good that 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 the police department is changing. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think that people. Uh, I mean, certainly the issue of the disproportionate involvement of African-American young people in crime yeah. is the most widely discussed topic within the African-American community, bar none. I mean, every place that you go, people are desperate 
for something that is going to deal with that problem. They, it, it, they're desperate because they're afraid of the consequences of crime. They're desperate because they are concerned about the human beings who are getting involved in that violence, either as victims or as perpetrators. And it is not only that it is it, – the idea that it's not talked about is not only wrong – but it's actually the opposite. It is an obsessive topic. What people are looking for is an actual constructive set of strategies that will work and that will work in a way that that is acceptable on a human level. Okay. You know, uh, when, uh, when, you let know, me ask you about that. Yeah. Is, is ostracizing, publicly shaming and condemning the perpetrators of the criminal acts a part of the community strategy – for dealing in response to this problem. You say people are uh, aware of it. They talk obsessively about it. They just want to do something about it. And I'm asking, is the making into a pariah, the person who would perpetrate this act, not as a matter of law, but as a matter of, of social value, yeah. going to be a part of that responsive strategy? Because that's something over which the community exerts more control than anybody else. I think that that is, I think that is partially happening and partially not. I think one reason it's not happening is because in many cases there's a level of nuance in what actually happens. So there's a guy he's involved in a gang, and why is he involved in a gang? There's lots of reasons why he's involved in a gang. Then he got involved in a shooting. Yeah. And you say, sure. you know, I, under I understand this guy at a human level. This is not an evil person. This is yeah. a person who, if he grew up in uh, you know, Hyde Park or Winnetka, he would not have had a gun that day and shot that person. Uh, I think there is a degree, and there's also, of course, fear that I think that, you know, before the reasons that your, you know, your wonderful interview on the book Ghetto Side, I thought brought out very well that there's over policing and under policing, and people are afraid, you know, that, uh, you know, there, there are, there are criminal organizations that will retaliate. Uh, if you cooperate with the police and the police are not necessarily in a position to be able to protect you against that and witness intimidation and issues of that sort are a real problem uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they have to be dealt with. There's um, – but I do think it, – it is certainly the case that for, that there are uh, – you know, if you listen to say Father Flager or many of the many religious leaders, uh, you know that that they will call. You know, he will walk down the street and call out gang members by name uh, when he sees them. You know, with uh, and and uh, there's a lot of that that goes on. I think what excites people when I go and talk to people around Chicago, uh, people get very excited when you can point to something evidence based that is also has a prevention dimension. I think a lot of people feel, you know. Every community has young people who are troubled and most communities have the resources and are given the help to help those troubled young people in a way that doesn't always involve the police. And, you know, we are – and very often when our young people have these problems, the only weapon that we have in – the only tool we have in the toolbox is the correctional system. And so when I talk about summer jobs and the randomized trials that show that summer jobs reduce criminal offending, people get incredibly excited about that. And they want to help. When I talk about school-based interventions to help kids, uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapies with kids to reduce uh, conflicts that might lead to violence, uh, people get very excited about that. They think that's really important. Uh, you know, that's a lot easier for them to get behind. Now, where where I think where I would like to see the community move further is in understanding the specific lethality of guns. I think one of the challenges that we have because because of the over-incarceration problem and the, and the loss of police legitimacy, some of the things that we really do need to do to focus on the gun offending become much harder to do. And, uh, and that is something where, uh, you know, that, that's just a reality that, that, you know, we, we Chicago police, I'll just say one thing and then I'll stop. The Chicago police department recovers more crime guns than New York and Los Angeles put together. Wow. And, and that, um, that's connected to the fact that there's a lot more shootings per capita going on in Chicago than these other places. Yeah, and if you talk to people, we just did – we're doing our second study of gun offenders in the jail. We did one where we interviewed 99 gun offenders. Forty of them told us that they had been shot in their adult lives. And, wow. and, and they're basically in an arms race with each other. 
Okay. And, and so, so we have to break that, and that's where the lack of, and that's where I'd like to see. Well, can we? Are there effective interventions that would really reduce the number of guns in the hands of these people? What would they be? Well, I think that I think that there's a combination of things. There's no there's no polio vaccine for this, but I think that there's a combination of things that can be helpful. There's some national policy things, basically like the background check stuff would be very okay. helpful. Uh, you know, you can go to Indiana or Riverdale, Illinois, and get a gun. Okay, uh, okay. So I didn't but, want to spend a whole lot of time on this, yeah, but 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 and then I think within the local thing, I think I think if there's, sorry, I'm babbling here. I think that where the social norms might be very helpful is in dealing with people who help other people get access to weapons. I think a lot of there's a lot of 20 year old young men who get access to a gun, and they do that because someone close to them who has access to one helps them get it. And that is, I think that's where the focus of opprobrium really needs to be because a lot of those young guys, if they're not sophisticated offenders, if they did not get help from their social network to get these guns, they wouldn't have them. This seems to me that that point could be generalized. I actually want to make two points. One of them is about shame, and I'll come back to that. But the one I want to make right now is about how community um, uh, normative mobilization could counteract the violence and whatnot, and, and you're talking about guns and the acquisition of them. But I want to make the more general point, which is that uh, all of this is going to be very opaque to any kind of a formal bureaucratic operation, whether it's policing or courts or social work mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, public health or whatever. It's going to be mm -hmm. the real sort of uh, interstices of social connectivity and motiv human motivation and moral valuation is going to be opaque to these things. From the inside, however, it's going to be granular, vivid, uh, and evident. You're going to know what your uh, lover, brother, or cousin are doing. You're going to know the kinds of things that people are involved in, and uh, you're going to either approve of it or disapprove of it. It's going to either elevate the person in the status of the thing, or it's going to cause them to be uh, uh, you know, viewed with uh, irrepute, uh, and, and so on in that fashion. The ways in which people interact with the formal policing and court mechanism is the least of it, is, is what I'm trying to say. And there could potentially be a lot more leverage there or a, a, a lot a lot that we don't even know. I don't know enough about it to be able, you'd have to get on the inside of it to, to actually see. Uh, so, for example, and I'll, and I'll stop on this, I always thought the book that I would love to see written about Ferguson that I never saw written was what the internal African American community interaction, you know, somebody saw something, they're gonna be aware. How did how did that work? What was that? You know, the gangs on the fringe and there's all this other kind of stuff going on. And then there's the Al Sharptons and the Cornell West and the whatever. But I wanted that story from the inside, you know, about how they policed each yeah. other's, you know, uh, response to that event. Uh, and, that, and, and, and you know, it would just be worth knowing. So that's one thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say about shame is I just confess this, okay? I just confess it to the world, to you, Harold Pollock, and to anyone else who hears this. Sometimes as an African-American, I'm just ashamed. They're going to call this the politics of respectability, and they're going to look at me like I'm an Uncle Tom. But I'll just confess it. The disproportionality of which you speak and the racial coloration of it and the things that happen, okay, leave me sometimes simply feeling ashamed. And even though I'm professionally trained to understand all of the nuanced and complex historical and social causal uh, factors, which I credit, I nevertheless, sometimes in the face of what seems to me to be carnage, okay, perhaps it's less carnage than it used to be, blah, 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 at some absolute level, the devastating disregard for the valuation of human life amongst my own people, okay? Uh, you know, neighborhoods that I grew up in on Chicago that were leafy green and I'd ride my bicycle a half mile and it was all great on a summer night. And now, you know, the crack vials and gunshots re echoing down the alleyways and hookers playing their trade on the street corner and whatnot. And I'm ashamed of it. Now, should I be, you know, is it wrong for me to be? It's probably more than what we could take up in the next couple of minutes that we have for this particular conversation. <laughs> possible, but, yeah. but is that not a legitimate? I mean, I want to try to defend this at some level. I mean, this is not a fully developed intellectual position. This is really just a kind of expression of a feeling that needs to be examined and, and critically examined. But is there no space for that? OK, I'm losing face. We are losing face. We think we're winning. I wrote a piece about this. 
You know, uh, I think that racial liberalism might be like a bubble, like a financial bubble, where, where we or they, because I'm not a racial liberal, are riding the crest of this contemporary acquiescence in our agitation and whatnot. But it's resting on a very shaky foundation, and that shaky foundation is the murder rate in Chicago and other things like that. That shaky foundation is if you don't have affirmative action, you can't get into the really elite school. I mean, come on, 50 years down from the 60s, and you're still turning on whether or not the Supreme Court goes left or right as to whether or not you can get into the school that everybody else including people who have been here only a couple of generations, are able, uh, their kids, the best and the brightest of them, to get admitted to. So, so I know this is all very terrible that I feel this way. Uh, the failure of African Americans where it has been uh, palpable uh, is something about which the, the argument about white supremacy in history just doesn't provide a sufficient fig leaf for me. I still feel exposed somehow. And is, well, is that okay? Is acknowledging that? Where have we taken the legacy of our forefathers, you know, who fought for freedom and blah, 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 blah. And now we've got a little piece of freedom and all we're complaining about is slavery and whatnot because we haven't done a damn thing for ourselves, even though when you look at other peoples to whom, of course, no such comparison should be made, but for whom everybody is making the comparison, they are able in a generation or two or three or six to, uh, to uh, make themselves a part of the American story. Harold, I, 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 let me just say this last thing and I'll stop. Yeah. I looked at the list of Jewish Nobel laureates because I had a question in my mind. Was Franco Modigliani, one of my teachers at MIT, Jewish? Of course he was. And so I went and I clicked on a link and the next thing you knew, I was staring at the list of Jewish Nobel laureates. Now, you can't tell me, I mean, perhaps you will tell me since you're Jewish, that you, you don't feel pride when you peruse that list. I mean, how could a Jew not feel pride at that? That's not, that doesn't have to be some kind of you know, evil, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, a racist kind of self-love, just a sense of pride. Well, there's a flip side of pride, okay? Just that when you look down the horror show list of what's happening in my country and in the neighborhoods where my people are living, there's a flip side of pride. I know it's horrible to say. I know it's all very wrong. But in all candor, that's what I feel. Well, I... I mean, there, there's so many things in what in what uh, yeah, you've raised many issues just now. Uh, by the way, I must say, the li Bernie Madoff uh, doesn't exactly add a whole lot to. Uh, uh, well, he shouldn't. <laughs> it, it's uh, you know, there, there's there's um, yeah, and a few uh, more of him, a few more of him, and man, you got a problem, don't you? Well, you know, it is. I mean, there's there's a lot there's a lot there. There's group reputation yep. and embarrassment uh, about uh, you know uh, about that, uh, and there's uh, um, you know just by necessity these kinds of uh, things are always one should always be careful. And of course, the the more you take refuge in your in pride in your group identity, the more uh, you're you know, there's always a question, well, what am I doing? Yeah, uh, sure. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, and I think about, it's also important to have a sense of, of not a, not a false sense, but a real sense, you know, there actually is a lot of progress. And I mean, certainly if you look at African American young people today, by many measures, a lot of progress has been made and the more, more progress needs to be made. But, uh, you know, this is not the world of 1970. And, uh, uh, and it's and and certainly if you look at the at the at the prevalence of a wide range of problem behaviors, they're actually down substantially in many ways, and they could come down more. Uh, there's, uh, uh, I mean, I see, you know, I mean, if you just move around, uh, uh, you know, there's just thousands and thousands of amazing people on the south side of Chicago doing great things, and whether they win the Nobel Prize or in economics or do or doing something else is another question, but. Uh, uh, I mean, there's certainly many, many people f in whom one can take pride, uh, and uh, uh, but I, I think I think part of I don't actually think you're all that conservative. First of all, I think we had a whole conversation about the role of community, and so where there was just nothing liberal slash conservative going on in a sort of ideological sense. It was really how do we think about mobilizing community resources 
to deal with yeah. this serious problem. And there's nothing, there's nothing inherently conservative about that. But I think you and I live within an academic community that in an ideological social world yeah. that is, that is, you know, that it's own particular thing. And ironic, I, I think one of the ironies, so we have this problem that substantively a lot of conservative ideas on major political issues are extremely uncompelling, certainly to the liberal cosmopolitan world of the university. So you have, a, you have a political party that questions global warming, that's slow on LGBT issues, that puts Donald Trump forward as its likely nominee. It's not all that surprising as a just fact about the politics of who's in academia and the fact that we have this in global cosmopolitan social world. Those ideas are going to be rejected and the Republican Party as a party is going to be in kind of disrepute in big parts of academia. That's, that says more about academia than it does the Republican Party, but go on. Well, I, I think it says about both. Like, you know, if you take a concrete issue like climate change, you know, there's just, I mean, you're not going to find too many climate physicists who are going to be Republicans if you just look at the stupidity of, you know, the, of a Republican presidential primary. Just to give an example. So, well, the, so let's I, just, on, but I, for I, the moment, stipulate that. I, I, no, I, I don't want to stipulate, but that's okay. Go ahead. I mean, I, I think. Yeah, you, you said the, that's okay. I, so I, I think the, the dismissal of the people who are recalcitrant about the mobilizations on behalf of reducing carbon emissions, which climate uh, 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 warriors foist, okay, that tell universities you must divest of fossil fuels. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to that. I, I, there's, I'm then, just, all I just wanted to say is that they're not all deniers. The, the idea that they're stupid is just the kind of, it's like calling somebody a communist in another period in American history. No, it's no, it's no. just an effort to discredit people who don't necessarily want to cooperate with the president's effort to get himself etched on um, uh, Rushmore as the guy who stood in Grant Park in 2008 and told us that the seas were going to stop rising, uh, trying to have a legacy. No, and no, for the people you're, who are you're, saying, no, I'm actually I don't making, wanna, yeah. you're, you're, I'm actually making a straightforward empirical claim, which is a lot of the issue positions okay. that are identified with the modern Republican Party are actually pretty stupid. And it's not too surprising that, that they're rejecting that. Can you, but, but, yeah, but the here's what I go with on get they LGBT gotta, is not stupid. It's not stupid oh, to, have, me, to have that view. That's, well, that's me, so let, dismissive. Wait, I, well, I, hold on just a minute. Hold on just a minute. Within the living... A memory of everybody, people like Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton had currently unacceptable positions on this issue. Okay? So the idea that somebody in Louisiana or North Carolina doesn't agree with us about this doesn't make them stupid. And the what reflex to call them stupid needs to be questioned on its own account. That's that's not you know, okay, well, I don't you... agree with you about global negotiations for climate change. Or 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 I don't agree with you about your parsing of how we should incur cost on behalf of speculative future benefits in that arena. I'm stupid. I'm a denier. Here's, here's where I'm going with this. Your objection is duly noted. Okay. And, and, and I'm now going to ride right over it. Uh, the, uh, okay. um, <laughs> as, let's, let's, let's accept that on a substantive level that there's substantial justification for, for most academics – to basically be pretty sympathetic to the Democrats and be pretty liberal. And okay. you can argue with that, but let's just stipulate that for uh, the we, we have to stipulate that since that's an obvious empirical fact of yeah. academia. So, so now let's think about the sociological consequences of that. So we now live in a world where most of our colleagues uh, and us you know, are pretty liberal on most things. And you know, we are a sociological grouping like any other sociological grouping. Yeah. And I think it does lead, even though I actually think the reasons for it are very explicable in terms of the retrograde nature of the National Republican Party right now, I think it is very harmful for the quality of intellectual discourse within the academy because, you know, I, I think it is, you know, we do, we, are, we, we do have a level of groupthink about certain kinds of issues that it would be very valuable if there was someone sitting at the table who could really call us on the sloppy thinking that might be I agree, I agree 100%. That's why I belong to Heterodox Academy, which I'm sure you do not belong to, but you could belong to. I, I, I sort of find myself in an odd position because I totally I'm – I'm an out and proud, very liberal person, but I actually do think that there is – we do need more ideological well, diversity. Well, here, here's one way of making that point. One way of making that point would be to say to the uh, race-obsessed 
people uh, mongering diversity and inclusion at the university, uh, just as one could say to Black Lives Matter, expand your view of what transforming American policing means to include within its orbit those who are not black, but who also have some such concerns. Um, uh, you could say diversity ought to mean more than a head count of who, is our, who are persons of color. Uh, Brown University just admitted its uh, class of, uh, what will it be, uh, 2020? Something like that. We just admitted our class of 2020. And the university touted the diversity of the class because 57% of the admits are students of color. Uh, and I thought, what an impoverished notion of diversity. I thought, how trendy and how, how proper. Uh, we're counting the non-whites. White has become this default thing that uh, the supremacy of which, the privilege of which, needs to be countered by an enlightened exploration of diversity. And I thought this, Harold, I thought, what an impoverished notion for a university to calibrate its engagement with diversity by looking at the superficial characteristics of the people who populate it and not at the substantive characteristics of those people. Those substantive characteristics would be things like, what do they believe in? What, what faith commitments do they bring with them to this place? Uh, what orientations of philosophical or science, whatever, whatever, you know what I'm saying. And um, that's, it seems to me that that's exactly what you're saying. And I'm saying we now here in the 21st century have betrayed in the universities. That this is not a small matter that we're willing to accept the cabal means that we've somehow betrayed our responsibility to our craft. We're, we're not really uh, creating the kind of institutions that... Um, you know, th that is, that's possible for us to create in terms of the vitality of the, of the intellectual discourse that happens there. Um, well, but, but let so. me turn that around, though, in a certain way, too, which is I think a lot of the attitudes that you are and, and, and your sort of sensibility that you are grappling with and expressing and wondering where that positions you on the ideological spectrum yeah. and so on come from your – stance as, as a person with an unusual perspective, in part because you're contrarian, in part for other reasons, uh, that um, uh, are um, within this bubble that you and I both live in. And uh, within the wider America, it's not so clear to me that that issue deserves the uh, the prominence that it might give. Hold on, someone's trying to call me on Skype, and I'm just I'm just hanging up on them. Okay. There. Uh, so you know, in the wider America, you know, we're sitting here, we're having a presidential campaign in which in which someone who probably has a 25 percent chance likelihood to be president is saying we should build a wall with Mexico, and is you know spouting all the stuff that you and I could now repeat. Uh, that's actually way more important than an than a bad book that some academic wrote that expressed some sort of flabby liberal ideas. And, and I think that we have to have some perspective that, that, uh, that you and I live in a world which is, which is important in America, but it's only one of the worlds in America. And, and some of the Michigas that you're pointing to, you know, is just easy to see as more important than it actually is. Well, in hold the on, hold on, hold on. okay. I, I accept that there are important things more important than, uh, disagreeing with a racial liberal. Uh, I'm supporting Hillary Rodham Clinton for the nomination and for the presidency of the United States. You know that I'm on the record for having done that. Um, uh, I think some of these uh, attacks on the Clintons, quote unquote, that have issued from the uh, quarters of uh, black activists and uh, racial advocacy activists are, um, are misplaced. And I don't think it's a waste of time to refute them because I think the I mean, Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton. I know these are different things, okay? But I mean, Al Sharpton, okay? So I don't think that's not worth fighting over, okay? Whether or not I'm going to go with what appears to be the um, Barack Hussein Obama engineered installment of Reverend Al as the successor of Martin Luther King Jr. within the civic constellation of American racial discourse. Am I going to go quietly into the night about that? You're going to tell me that doesn't matter as much as a wall on Mexico's border, and I'll agree with you. It doesn't. But I ain't going quietly into the night about that. I, uh, I, don't, I must say, I don't see – I think you have a 
greatly, greatly exaggerated sense of the importance of Al Sharpton. Sharpton. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So he's a cultural icon that will hopefully fade quickly uh, with the passing years. We'll see. We'll see. I just know that presidential candidates go and have audiences with him as he brokers the black vote. And I know that he's the ambulance chaser in chief. Should any police a cop who happens to be uh, white shoot any kid who happens to be black anywhere in America? These things I know. Uh, and and I know, as I say, that he's been installed in that position by the president of the United States. I think that the record is rather clear on that. I think that the uh, the person who's really the the person who, who will be remembered as at least the next the next face in the chapter of Martin Luther King was the last face is actually, of course, President Obama, who uh, who operates in a slightly different way and and uh, in who. Uh, Oh, uh, don't! So must, we're uh, we're 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 way too late in the hour to begin that conversation, Harold. Get are, your get uh, your hands off of the iconography of Negro hero worship. Don't you <laughs> dare implant the son of a Kenyan immigrant in the uh, in the position of being the heir to Martin Luther King Jr. without at least a discussion. <laughs> well, I was just uh, saying with the folk popular. whom you are having him represent. <laughs> Fair enough. I, well, I, I think you and I should debate this. But I see there's a case. I, I do see that there's a case. <laughs> there, but anyway, by the way, I, the case for just allowing him to serve another term, I think, is increasing as we watch. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with that, actually. The, the, um, uh, and Although it, I'm a Hillary supporter. And it is uh, – I am as well. And it's uh, – and, uh, and I think, by the way, for all of the discussion, of all, it, it is to me it is very noteworthy that – that she is clobbering Bernie Sanders and will certainly clobber the Republicans among African Americans. And I think it shows that, that the majority of the African American vote is a very pragmatic one that is very focused on a wide range of issues where you and I would probably agree that are not, not getting a huge amount of attention right now, but are certainly of equal importance to the you know, police brutality and so on. And I think that that there are a lot of people concerned about health care, a lot of people concerned about the Supreme Court, are concerned about uh, preserving anti-poverty programs and uh, and and want somebody who actually would defeat the Republican and the thing that uh, uh, you know the, when I was first started canvassing for Barack Obama the the basic question I got from every African American voter I talked to was just is this guy for real and I think that people are wondering you know what has Sanders done wrong that he's not getting as many black votes among older people particularly and I think the basic answer is people are just they're just not convinced that he's for real in terms of his ability to genuinely uh, beat the Republican. It's funny how a lot of a lot of my students are like, you know what? Maybe if a Republican wins, it's like not the worst thing in the world. Harold. And I'm and I'm thinking, you know, if I live in Flint, Michigan, I'm thinking it's the worst thing in the world. Harold, I heard Bernard Sanders give the revised answer to the question that he got uh, at the New York Daily News the other day about how he would break up the banks. This was on Morning Joe, the day after he had failed to give a coherent answer to that question for the Daily News. And it was terrifying, Harold. He says he's going to use a provision in Dodd-Frank. And then he says, but my law would be better. And by my law, the Secretary of the Treasury would be empowered if a bank was determined to be above a certain size to, quote, break them up, close quote. And I thought, we're getting ready to turn the global trillion dollar uh, financial industries regulation over to a guy who just says the Secretary of the Treasury, if they get too big, is going to break them up. I mean, I know that for many people, it's obvious that you, quote, want to break up the banks, close quote. But I just have the instinct that something really, really important would be at stake with respect to how those contracts and, uh, ent and entailments and obligations got parsed and, and measured. And too big, break them up. I, it just, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, doesn't well, work. Say, it doesn't work for say, me, Harold. I'm sorry. It doesn't work for me. But doesn't, but just when you say, are we, you know, we're getting ready to turn the turn this thing over to him. The answer is no, we're not ready to turn it over to him. But can you imagine if if Hillary if a seventy four year old woman had given a the same interview that Sanders gave to the Daily News where it, it wasn't so much that he was wrong, it was that he's a guy who's been a senator and a congressman for decades. Yeah. And the lack of I mean the difference in policy command between Hillary Clinton yeah. and Sanders is so total that, I mean, it may be that she's wrong on any number of issues. She shouldn't have given, uh, you know, those speeches right. to Wall Street, whatever. There's a bunch of things you can critique. But just does this person just know what they're talking about? Right. And, but I mean, now we both know, declared, it's incredible. We both declared ourselves to be Hillary supporters. So nobody's going to take us seriously. 
But that's true of her and anybody else who's thinking about becoming president of the United States. The distance between her grasp across dozens upon dozens upon dozens of areas of substantive policy, down three levels into the weeds deep, her intellectual expansiveness uh, coupled with decades of experience, obviously she's the most qualified person running for president by a very, very large margin. You, you know what? She, she, she <laughs> reminds me of a lot of the women that I work with in public health and social services who sort of show up. They've got their, uh, you know, the, they've got their binder full of stuff. They come to the meeting. They don't, they don't glad hand around the coffee machine that much. They kind of know their stuff. They do the work. And they're the people that everybody counts on to actually get the stuff done. And, uh, and there is a sort of – and I really respect that. And there's, there is an aspect to Sanders. I think he's raised – I actually think he's raised some important issues around economic populism and the need to hold Wall Street accountable that I – you know, sort of like Elizabeth Warren. I think that's been valuable. But there is a bit of a show horse aspect to the guy. Or not, maybe not show horse, but, that, that's, but, but there's a sort of – he will he will wag his finger in your face about the broad issue, but when you say, "Okay, let's get down to it and talk about what to do here," that that Hillary Clinton is just the person who's just going to have a much greater mastery of, "Okay, what is it that we can do?" And like I looked at their you know the difference in their health plans, where he doesn't really you know he gave this eight page single payer health plan, which is sort of not a plan. It's basically this is what it would look like if it, if we somehow got it done. This is kind of what it would look like in a sort of extremely aspirational version with no roadmap to get from here to there. But speaking of roadmaps to get from here to there. Yeah, I know. We've stop. been going on for some time. Thank you for your time, Harold. Lovely conversation. And we're still friends, which is the most important thing. We are. We are. And I should point out that over time, I think I've, conv- I think I've lost every individual argument, but I think that I've moved you closer to my positions on many things, but clearly not close enough. So I'm going to keep at it. Yeah, I, have, I made a concession or two during this last conversation, I believe. So mm-hmm. I won't I won't contradict you on that. Take care. But you should be coming closer to my positions on some things too. No doubt. Bye. No doubt. Great to talk to you. Bye.